at the University of California, Berkeley. She has offered expert testimony at the United Nations, the European Parliament, the UK Parliament, and our own US Congress, and has been variously acknowledged and awarded for her work. Her recent publications including, include Breaking Worlds, Religion, Law, and Nationalism in Majoritarian India, and second book is Majoritarian State, How Hindu Nationalism is Changing India. Please welcome me in joining a woman of steel, my sister, Dr. Angana Chatterjee, to offer her remarks. Welcome, sister. Thank you, Dr. Batalia. It's a pleasure to be here. Honored to participate in this conversation. Um, I would like to speak today to uh, some issues in Hindu nationalism in India and the United States, uh, roughly comprising various fragments entitled Transnational Hindu Nationalisms. The present, the Narendra Modi led Bharatiya Janata Party government's reach to configure a Hindu nationalist state in India has commenced the ascent of political majoritarianism, enforcing states of emergency across the country. His government incorporates populism, nationalism, and majoritarianism, while a grassroots cadre of millions, tens of millions of Hindu nationalists weaponize religion and politics to incite the Hindu majority to unparalleled dominance in India today. Popular elections and the notion of consent in India raises crucial questions regarding how assent is manufactured and translates to electoral victories and what energized the world's largest electorate to vote right-wing nationalists to power twice in 2014 and 19 and what in fact democracy means. Legacy. Protracted political conflict and inequitous governance has facilitated the rapid consolidation of power by the Hindu right in India since its formulation as a state in 1947. This trajectory derives from colonial and pre-colonial imaginations, ideologies, and desires. The cultural dominance of nationalist Hinduism, I would say, emerged through its alignment with Hindutva. Hindutva or Hinduness is not an ideology, Hindu nationalists say, but integral practice, a lifestyle for nationhood. Hindu cultural, economic and political dominance, or rather the cultural, economic and political dominance of Hindus in India and its turbulent markers of religion, ethnos and identity are mobilized to depict dominant Hindus as the national race and authentic citizens of India. The idea of Hindus as a unitary majority is vigilantly enforced across vast differences of language, culture, religion, styles of worship and practice, history, religious beliefs. Simultaneously, the fall lines between minority and majority are fomented across the body politic to engineer difference as conflict and pose the minority and the other as allies and their, sorry, and their allies as parasitic, dangerous, and seditious. Since its inception, movements in Nazi Germany and Italian fascism have been formative to Hindu nationalism. M.S. Golwalkar, an early Hindutva ideologue, professed admiration for Nazi Germany, noting the non-Hindu may stay in the country, wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, not even citizens' rights. Seven decades later, the Modi-led government's aggressive minoritization is made synonymous with national security, making Hindu nationalism the sine qua non of nation building in India today. In the direct line of impact are Muslims numbering over 210 million in India, Christians, Sikhs, Adivasis and Dalits and other vulnerable communities. India, the world's most populous country of 1.4 billion, has a burgeoning middle class of 31%, more than the entire population of the United States. Hindu nationalists enact vengeance for imagined wrongs using bulldozers to raise property and evict Muslims. The politicization of religion and racialization of, is, of Muslims target difference as anti-national, while Islamophobia repositions India's already conflicted democracy. 
The chief minister of Uttar Pradesh, a prominent Hindu nationalist leader, Yogi Adityanath, in February of this year reportedly claimed that India is a Hindu nation because every citizen of India is a Hindu. The BJP's furtherance of forms of coloniality in Kashmir through forcing citizenship on people in descent to Indian rule, while seizing citizenship away from Bangla Muslims and other vulnerable communities in Assam in Northeast India through prejudicial laws, seek to actualize long-standing promises to unify India. Old and new forms of violence are activated to decrease speech acts, aggression, and assault, whose signs, symbols, and performative agency intertwine and intersect. Prejudicial citizenship laws in India today are akin to the Nuremberg laws instituted in Nazi Germany in 1935 and fortify legal discrimination based on religion, privileging Hindus in defining citizenship. On August 5, 2019, Kashmir's partial autonomy was countermanded. Many in Kashmir understand themselves to be under Indian occupation, living in context akin to collective internment. The uh, Unlawful Preven Activities Prevention Act amended by the Modi government in 2019 enables special procedures to handle terrorism-related activities pertaining to individuals and organizations, singling out and targeting persons of Muslim descent today, including human rights defender and my colleague Kuram Parvez, journalist Irfan Mehraj, and others, including political leader Yasin Malik. Kuram Parvez's targeting, arrest and detention exemplifies the grave risks confronting human rights defenders today. Alleging love jihad to energize anti-Muslim sentiment, uh, the anti-miscegenation movement, Hindu nationalist groups in Uttarakhand threaten and brutalize Muslims, causing families to flee the area. In Manipur, at the other end, violence erupted in part connected to the Hindu Mayathi communities desire to gain access to affirmative resources reserved for minorities. Hindu nationalism in India operates through a large ecosystem of organizations and a large extensively uh, uh, militarizing cadre co comprising millions of Hindu activists on the ground in rural areas and in urban areas and those that are known as semi-urban areas in the country. Hindu nationalism in the United States is a latticework of organizations that fuel long distance nationalism in the diaspora, especially in the United States. And its organizational capacity or agency mirrors in a much smaller way, but mirrors those of their counterparts in India. 18 years ago, a coalition comprising of individuals such as myself and emerging organizations at that point of time called for the revocation of Narendra Modi's visa to visit the United States. At that time, the United States denied Mr. Modi a visa, reportedly noting him to be responsible for violations of religious freedom in the state of Gujarat, of which he was then chief minister, and where in 2002, the pogrom against Muslims took place. The Indian government and judiciary failed to hold Mr. Modi accountable for Gujarat 2002, notwithstanding the brave and just actions of some. This dereliction has been formative to Narendra Modi's rise to power and the massification of Hindu nationalism today. In the United States, Hindu nationalists have attempted to create an organ organizational structure, as I noted, that is akin to that in India, successfully penetrating into educational systems and centralized regulatory commissions, for example. I'm going to do a, a brief summary uh, here of what the, the Hindu nationalist umbrella of or family of organizations, the Sangh Parivar, looks like in the United States. As of 2020, there are reportedly 222 chapters or shakas of the Hindu Swam Sevak Sangh, which is the U.S. counterpart of the militant Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh in, the, in India. In the United States, the Hindu Swam Sevak Sangh exists across 32 states and in 166 country, uh, 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 cities, sorry, uh, operating weekly with... Uh, I would say uh, from research, uh, 
approximately 8,000 or over 8,000 participants in its family programming and eight, uh, youth programming, according to their tax records and reported by uh, uh, various scholars in the United States today. Its work between 2019 and 2020 included 426 additional organizations and impact close to 45,000 families in over 198 cities in the United States. Another Hindu nationalist organization in the United States, the Vishwa Hindu Parishad of America, reportedly has 21 chapters across 14 states per its website. And its cultural projects often use different names, uh, which I will not go into in the interest of time. I'm just looking at the clock. Uh, between 2001 and 2019, according to uh, various sources of information, including available tax returns, uh, seven Hindu nationalist affiliated charitable groups in the United States reportedly spent close to 150 million uh, US dollars in their programs, including uh, sending a, a lot of it to India. Uh, the groups uh, include uh, Ekal Vidyalaya Foundation of India, the India Development Relief Fund, uh, and Seva International. These groups have also undertaken advocacy and lobbying to influence U.S. Congress members and government bodies to pressurize. Also, they've undertaken advocacy to pressurize of education. Uh, they've lobbied to influence US-based higher education institutions and made significant grants to institute chairs at, the, at various of these places. And they've also undertaken mobilizing actions with that can have likely or that have had likely impact on Indian actions. Uh, they have, from my understanding, outreach to more than 100 congressional offices They've participated or had held programs, had or held programs in over 100 temples. Uh, they've coordinated visits of uh, hundreds of members from the United States to India and reciprocally hosted uh, members of Hindu nationalists, including very prominent members of Hindu nationalist organizations from India in the United States. Uh, Another uh, institution, the Hindu American Foundation, for example, uh, has received and spent monies uh, in its effort to influence uh, policies of the United States. Uh, I'm going to stop here and transition and close in the next two minutes. The Hindu right has fashioned a would say an institutional umbrella in the US diaspora to mobilize a transnational Hindutva movement that has had far reaching impact since 2002. This bears testimony to the power and resources of long distance Hindu nationalism today bolstered by uh, as well, extremely wealthy companies in Silicon Valley and together their organizing cap cap capacities in the United States uh, is something that we need to investigate, we need to understand, and we need to understand how to intervene on the impact that they have had to support Hindu nationalism, not only in the United States, but certainly to bolster Hindu nationalism and Hindu nationalist governance in India. I will return to India to remind us of a few points in closing. The resistance of survivors of pogroms and mass violence across India today are met with force there. Human rights defenders and allies and alliances of social justice, journalists, scholars, students, and their principal articulations are demonized as dissent and criminalized. For work, I have undertaken in India and in Indian administered Kashmir, for example, my colleagues and I have been physically targeted with violence by Hindu militias. We've been targeted as well by state officials and 
orders to unnerve some of our work appears to have been reportedly generated at the highest levels. I bring this up to say that this work comes with challenges and consequences, even as this time, now time, requires our most vigilant efforts to dissent uh, right-wing Hindu nationalism in its various manifestations in India and across its diasporas. Those of us that are also forced into exile in diasporas and our allies are differently targeted. I wish to underscore that. Postscript. Authoritarian political regimes lack transparency. They centralize power. They escalate militarism and weaponize social fault lines. The govern their government of people is increasingly imbricated with mobs, militias, and social and political violence. This is India today under the Modi-led government. I wish to note that uh, just between 2018 and 2021, 4,695 political riots have been recorded by government agencies in India. The Indian government has opposed marriage rights for same-sex couples before the Indian Supreme Court in March 2023. India's press freedom in 2023 has ra is ranked 161, 180 countries. The Indian state, in closing, I wish to say, uses extreme laws and social and political violence and presents those as necessary for national security. The rule of law is subverted through arbitrary governance in the name of national well-being. Unchecked by international consequences, repeated calls to genocidal violence and the extermination of Muslims reverberate today. The fault lines of physical and social death and livability and despair shift and blur. The normalization of absolute nationalism saturates the everyday with precarity for hundreds of millions in India today, prompting widespread foreboding and social and spiritual breakdowns. Thank you. Thank you, Angana, for your enlightening and very, very helpful remarks. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to request, if you do have a question, uh, kindly send it to the Q&A box. That is the only place at which we are accepting your questions. So if you are typing it in, in the chat box, could you kindly put them through the Q&A box? Because that is what we are monitoring. Thank you so much, everyone. And now we'd like to introduce our second speaker is Dr. Audrey Trishke. She is an associate professor of South Asian history at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. Her research focuses on cultural, imperial, and intellectual history of medieval and early South Asia, including India, as well as the politics of history in the modern times. So she kind of spans that history and how history continues to live today and its connection. She's the author of three books and is currently working on a single volume history of India with support of the National Endowment for Humanities Public Scholars Grant. And as I said in my opening remarks, I wish my own daughters would also be as brave as Audrey, you and Angana. It is my pleasure now to invite uh, Dr. Trishke to share her remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here with you all, even if to discuss a somewhat unpleasant subject. So hopefully everybody can see my PowerPoint. Okay, I think yes, the image can. is awesome. I think the images help help a little bit. So. I'm here today to make just some, some remarks that I think are nicely complementary to what we've already heard from Dr. Chatterjee. Um, and I'm going to focus more on Yankee Hindutva, which is not my phrase. I'm, I'm shamelessly taking that from another scholar. And let me just open by saying sort of why I am here. I am primarily a scholar of pre-modern South Asia. It begs the question of why I'm talking on modern politics. And I come at this from three different sort of perspectives. The first is that being a scholar of pre-modern South Asia actually positions me pretty well to comment on certain aspects of Hindu nationalism. And that's because Hindu nationalists ground their authority and many of their claims on falsifications of the past. 
Right. So they're, they're the ones who, you know, sort of infringing on my territory, as it were. Um, and that positions me to say certain things and make certain arguments about their political ideology. The second angle I come at this from um, is as a, a recurrent target, shall we say, of Hindu nationalists who are unusually interested in, in me and my work and so harass me quite a bit. And then third is that I did a roughly two-year research project focused on the U.S.-based Hindu right. I ran this from early 2021 and then closed out the project in late 2022. And I specifically focused on a number of Hindu nationalist groups currently operating in the United States. And so drawing on those sort of three different areas, I have three core points that I want to make today about U.S.-based Hindu nationalism. And each of these is contrasted in the parentheses to a point of Hindu right-wing propaganda, right, Hindutva propaganda. So first, Hindu nationalism is new. It's about 100 years old. That's new for a historian, okay? And it's modeled on European fascism. So it's neither ancient nor is it exclusively Indian. The second point is that Hindu nationalism is transnational, a point that Dr. Chatterjee also very nicely made and that it is organized, okay? And so what this means is when Hindu nationalists in the US, they often say, oh, we're just US citizens, we're just talking as US citizens. That's not really the full story. They also like to pretend that their responses to things and their outrage are grassroots, and it is not. Hindu nationalism is organized. Last but not least is that Hindutva has connections with other far-right movements, that's true transnationally, but I want to give you some specific examples of what that looks like in the American context, specifically focusing on Hindu nationalist links with white Christian nationalists here. So starting with a little bit of history, okay, call, call it a professional hazard. I always start with the past. So Hindu nationalism was first articulated roughly 100 years ago, okay, in the 1920s. It has roots slightly further back, 1890s, maybe the 1880s, but it does not go back further than that. In the 1920s, two key events happened that led to the articulation of Hindutva ideology as we see it today. The first is the publication of a book in 1923 by V.D. Savarkar titled Hindutva, okay, and it popularized that term Hindutva, okay, which was invented a couple of decades earlier. If you think it's Sanskrit, by the way, you're wrong. Okay, it's fake Sanskrit. The second big event was the founding of the RSS, the Rashtriya Svayam Sevak Sangh, an all-male paramilitary group. Okay, pictured here in their white collared shirts, khaki shorts. The RSS's major goals were ideological indoctrination, starting with young boys and going through adulthood, and arms training. That's remained the same over the last century. Now, if you look at these RSS gentlemen and you think, man, that kind of looks familiar, right? The shirts, the khakis, Nazi-like salute, none of that is by accident. They were in fact modeled on fascist movements in Europe that were quite, quite robust in the 1920s and 30s, as hopefully everybody knows as a point of basic world history. Now, the connections between Hindu nationalists and European fascists of the early 20th century are very well known. They are very widely documented. There's a lot of evidence for them. What I really want to drive home with you all today is that early Hindutva leaders and articulators embrace the intolerance of minorities that is endemic to fascism. Okay, so this is not something that they shied away from. It's not something that they tried to disavow. It's something that they celebrated. So consider a couple of things. The Nazis and Savarkar, author of Hindutva here, published approvingly of one another in November of 1938. If you know European history, you know that November of 1938, that is the month of the Kristallnacht pogrom. That same year, 38, speaking in Nagpur, Savarkar proclaimed, and I quote, if we Hindus grow stronger, in time, these Muslim friends of the League type will have to play the part of German Jews. In 1939, at a Hindu Mahasabha meeting, the Mahasabha was a sort of early political predecessor of the BJP, 
At this meeting in 39, one speaker, Bhai Parmanand, exhorted his audience, and I quote, make Savarkar your Fuhrer, and in, no nay, and in no time, your nation will rise to the pinnacles of glory. Now, whereas for the Nazis, Jews were the hated other, for Hindu nationalists, it's Muslims. They're the hated minority. And so Hindu nationalist attacks on Muslims, they're not a flaw of Hindutva. They're a core feature. It's part of what drives the entire engine. Pick a day and I'll show you an attack, a Hindutva attack on Indian Muslims, right? They occur literally every single day. Since we're talking about America, I figured I would give American examples, okay? And we have to go back like, you know, last week, basically, for that, all right? So as mentioned, you know, guess who came to dinner last week? Prime Minister Modi at the White House. And quite predictably, this has been followed by a series of Hindu nationalist attacks on Muslims. One was that we saw a BJP politician talking about Barack Hussein, Obama, emphasizing the middle name and using it to go after Indian Muslims. Okay. Uh, Obama made some mildly critical comments about Modi last week. That's what occasioned this. And then the second, which is ongoing as I speak, is that Modi was pressured to take questions from the press last week. This is exceedingly rare. Okay. He's taken a total of two questions, as far as I know, in the last nine years. One of them was asked by an American journalist who happens to be Muslim. And in response, Hindu nationalist IT cells have been fully mobilized, it would seem, and they are maliciously attacking her. Okay, and that is ongoing. So this Hindutva hatred of Muslims, it comes out in all of these specific instances. And when you see them, think of them as kind of bubbles bubbling up, right? And beneath the surface, it's a lava of hatred. Let me turn to my second point which is that Hindutva is both transnational and organized, okay? Hindu nationalism is promoted through a range of groups known as the Sangh Parivar, the family of the RSS. There are many graphs you can find of it online. A lot of them will show it hierarchically, the RSS at the top, and it sort of branches down in various ways. I like to think of it more like this, which sort of highlights the somewhat diffuse nature of, of the system. You have the RSS at the center, which is known as the HSS overseas. And then you have different groups leading different branches of the Hindu nationalist family. So the BJP is heading up political affairs. The BHP is heading up religious affairs and so forth. Note the slashes. All of the major Sangh Parivar groups exist in both Indian versions and American versions. Okay, some groups began to replicate themselves in the United States about 50 years ago when we started to see large scale migration from India to the United States. Often these groups don't hide their connections, right? So, whereas we have the VHP in India, which is notable for having led a lot of, of, of uh, pretty robust violence against Indian Muslims, we have the VHPA, the VHP of America. The BJP in India, overseas friends of BJP here. Now, this is not comprehensive, okay? There are hundreds of Hindu nationalist groups operating in the United States at present, and it's sort of an ever-shifting list, right? One thing that's hard to capture in a graph is that we have these sort of pop-up groups. They'll come up, they'll do a couple of things, and then they'll sort of go away, right? And that's one way of sort of flying under the radar. Now, this can be, a, this is important, this idea of flying under the radar. Because with Hindu nationalist groups like the VHPA, like the HSS, like Seva International, okay, which just the which heads the service wing internationally of the Sun, they face a very serious and a very uncomfortable question because of their ties to Indian groups. Okay, this is a question that's uncomfortable for them, and frankly, it's not all too comfortable for me as a researcher either. Given their overseas ties, given that they have ties to groups in India. For whom do U.S. Hindu nationalist groups speak? They say, we're just U.S. citizens, we're speaking as such, and that's not really the full story. And there's competing pressures here. On the one hand, Hindu nationalist groups do feel some pressure, at least, to comply with U.S. laws, 
so that they can continue to operate here, so that they cannot be the targets of federal investigations, and so forth. And of course, if you are acting on behalf of a foreign entity, whether it's the RSS, the BJP, or the VHP, in America, you do have to register with FARA, the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Some Hindu nationalist groups here do, but they are the exception, not the rule. Okay, the best examples, probably overseas friends of the BJP. They registered as a foreign agent somewhere around the time of the Howdy Modi events of 2019. Okay, if everyone was a little skittish around that. Now, most Hindu nationalist groups do not register with FARA. And in fact, this is the other, the second sort of pressure point. They want to comply with U.S. laws, but many of them want to be seen as distinctly American. They do not want to, they do not want their associations with India to be highlighted. Okay. And the Hindu American Foundation is probably the best example of a group that gets absolutely irate anytime you even mention their India connections, right? I guarantee you they're already upset that I have put them on a slide with an image of Farah, right? They're, they're already mad about it. My third point. Hindutva is part of the global far right. Okay, Hindu nationalism is a distinctly right wing ideology, and they have a lot of far right friends. Now, one easy way to show this with pictures uh, is is you know sort sort of of the um, the of the big guys here, right? So here you have Prime Minister Modi pictured with Trump, Bolsonaro, and Netanyahu. It's worth noting, just to give a glimmer of hope, that of those four men, only two of them are still in power. When we turn to the United States, I do not have folks that are nearly as identifiable, right, photo-wise to, to show you, but Hindu nationalist groups in America have actually forged some very intriguing, very interesting, and rather deep connections with other far-right movements here. And I want to give you some examples of Hindutva and white Christian nationalist connections. If you don't know, Hopefully you do, okay? But if you don't, you should, that white Christian nationalism is easily the most robust right-wing movement that we currently have in the United States, okay? And threatens American pluralistic values in all kinds of ways. And some Hindu nationalists really get in on that stuff, right? So we have the Hindus for Trump. Um, this is from a poster from 2016 depicting Trump as a Hindu deity, right? This is them, right? not me. Another way to see this is in the fact that, th that there were Hindu nationalists at the January 6th insurrection attempt, which I'm showing here by with an image of the insurrection with an Indian flag in the foreground. Now, this causes some points of confusion sometimes, so let me just briefly note. There were Indians at the insurrection attempt that were not Hindu nationalists. Okay, so not all the Indians there, people of Indian descent were Hindu nationalists. There were also Hindu nationalists there that are not Indian. Okay, because of Hindutva's connections with other far right movements in the US, we do have white Hindu nationalists here. Third example is, is this. This is, this is a, a screenshot of, of a um, sort of webinar event hosted by the Coalition of Hindus of North America, which is a sort of small time Hindu nationalist group here, although they're, they're trying hard to make a bigger name for themselves. So let's see how, how much longer they remain small time. And here they're hang they're talking about alleged biases against Hindu Americans with Representative Andrew Clyde, okay, who is a uh, particularly disturbing, shall we say, uh, Georgia Republican. Among Clyde's views are that he completely soft pedaled the insurrection stuff. He's also on record advocating a, basically a theocracy in America, right? He likes to say things like. America's American democracy should be based on biblical principles and things like this. Now you might ask, do Hindu nationalists really want to live in a white Christian nationalist state? No, but what brings them together is certain right-wing ideas, including patriarchy, an emphasis on communities being socially separate. That's something the, the right-wing in general sees eye to eye on. And then, of course, the great glue of right-wing movements in our times, hating on Muslims. So, in sort of brief conclusion, all right, this is a little bit about Hindu nationalist groups, where they come from, how they operate. I want to note that there is fuzziness around the edges, 
right? So a common question, I don't know if we've gotten it today, but a common question I get is, how do I know if a group is Hindu nationalist? And there's not an obvious checkbox, right? Um, we look for certain views, but but there there is fuzziness and unclarity there. And sometimes that's honest, and other times that is deliberate and and evasive. Okay. What we are clear on, however, is what Hindu nationalist ideology sort of in in its in the form in which most adhere to it and advance it, what it is and what it advocates and how it threatens the pluralistic society in which at least a lot of us would like to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey, for your enlightening presentation, including your PowerPoint. Several of our attendees uh, would like to get a copy of today's program. And those of you who are here on Zoom uh, can now, in fact, uh, you'll get a link tomorrow, which has a copy of today's program uh, that we have here live. It will be on RFP USA Facebook page. Uh, there was one question that came in terms of uh, what is the criteria to label a Hindu in the U.S. a nationalist versus just a Hindu? So thank you, Audrey, for already answering that question before it was asked. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them to the Q&A box. As many of you are aware that RFP USA, we are a membership-based organization. And so we have several member religious communities. And for our webinars, we typically invite a representative from one of our member communities to offer a response to what our panelists have talked about. And so today we are joined by Sister Sunita Vishwanath. Sunita, if you could turn your camera on, perfect. Sunita is a progressive Hindu faith leader and a human rights activist. She co-founded the member organization of RFP USA, which is Sadhana, the Coalition of Progressive Hindus, and she is also the co-founder of Hindus for Human Rights. She was honored as a champion of change by President Obama in 2015, and the Center for American Progress named her one of the 21 faith leaders to watch in 2021. I must say to you, friends, with all deep respect, I don't think I have met a woman of more courage, more determination, and deeper humility than Sunita. Please join me in welcoming Sunita Vishwanath to offer her response. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dharanjitji. And uh, I'm deeply moved by um, the powerful remarks of my sisters, Angana and Audrey, um, soldiers in the trenches with me against hate. Uh, as Taranjitji said, I'm the co-founder of um, RFP USA member organization Sadhana and four-year-old advocacy organization Hindus for Human Rights. And you've heard from Audrey and Angana about what is happening in India um, and the footprint of this march to the far right in the diaspora, in America and other countries. So I want to respond um, to the comments by two powerful leaders um, from a Hindu perspective. Um, this is what I am giving my day and night to, building a Hindu platform, an inclusive Hindu platform to fight hate, especially the hate that we just heard about in great horrific detail, the hate that is happening and the violence that is happening in the name of my faith, my faith tradition, the Hindu tradition. I don't go so far as to say that the Hindutva adherents, the Hindu nationalists are not Hindu, they are Hindu. It's just that the Hindu faith that they embrace is the opposite of mine. They embrace, embrace the worst possible interpretation of the teachings of Hindu faith traditions. And I aspire and my organizations aspire to be, to embody, to build and to support the best possible version of Hindu faith traditions, which are diverse. There is no one, Hinduism has this, um, has this asset, this great liberating truth about it, which is that it's very diverse. There is no one book, one um, way of being a Hindu. The particular teachings of Hinduism that motivate me 
are many of them from the Gita. One, this notion of loka sangraha, which is the well-being of all. The notion of paradukha dukhi, which is that the best Hindu sees the sorrows and joys of another as one's own. And then the best line for me personally from the Gita is when Lord Krishna says, it is better to do one's own dharma imperfectly than somebody else's dharma perfectly, which means think for yourself, be who you are. And what, what for me, there's nothing more liberating than that. We heard a little bit about the vicious trolling, the misogynistic vicious trolling of women, including Audrey, Audrey and Angana, but also the journalist Rana Ayub and a filmmaker called Lina Manimekale, who is, is, has 14 arrest warrants against her and disgusting sexual threats and beheading threats that she receives every single day for a film that she made. Um, of me, I am trolled constantly in very disgusting and vicious ways. And most recently, as we heard, Sabrina Siddiqui, the Wall Street Journal reporter is going through this trolling viciously right now. The people who are doing this trolling claim to be Hindu. And I just want to say, probably anybody in the audience or anybody listening now, I hope their Hindu faith if they are Hindu, does not permit this kind of violence and this kind of harm to human beings, especially women. I believe and my organizations believe that because this far right movement is growing, is at the, its zenith, we just gave the red carpet welcome in America to Narendra Modi and Narendra Modi and his BJP will be pumped up and will go back. I mean, in India, they will be even more popular and even more likely to win the next election. At this moment, because the majority community in India is Hindu and because this far right movement of hate and violence is not the Hinduism, the Hindu tradition that most of us learned from our parents and grandparents. We were taught love, ahimsa, nonviolence, and that God is in you and me, no matter who you are. That is what we were taught. We need as Hindus to stand up not only for human rights, for democracy, inclusive democracy in India and religious freedom. We actually as Hindus need to fight for our faith. That's what we need to do. And if we do that, then we save ourselves, we save our souls, we save our democracy in India. That movement against Hindu nationalism must have two twin pillars. And these are the pillars that hold up sadhana and Hindus for human rights. One is a complete and unapologetic, unwavering opposition, rejection of caste. And the twin pillar is a similar unwavering opposition to Hindu nationalism, which means a, a devotion to Hindu Muslim unity. I invite any any Hindus out there who want our various many diverse communities to come together as children play together, as students study together, and as adults build inclusive democracy together, speak up. This is a time it, in the future, if this everything that you just heard keeps marching forward to the worst possible um, consequence, we've seen it in the 20s, Audrey laid out the history for us. If we continue to march in this, in this direction, we will regret, we will not be able to look at our children and grandchildren of the future in their eye when they ask us, what were you doing in the 2020s? Ask yourself that, que that question, what kind of Hindu are you and what are you doing right now? My two organizations are platforms you can join but you don't even have to join the platform. You just need to have these conversations in your family. That itself is a good start. Let me end by saying that um, a few years ago in Toronto, I was there, Tarunjati was there. Um, a number of us were there at the Parliament of World Religions and our beloved Hindu radical monk and social justice warrior, Swami Agnivesh was there. We were with him and he was receiving death threats from Hindu right-wing people who were at the parliament. He is no longer there today. He passed away a couple of years ago. 
we have to be the Swami Agnivesh's of our future and our and the next generation's future. We have to support powerful resistors of hate who are Hindu religious leaders. We have to do that. At the upcoming Parliament of World Religions, right coming up in August in Chicago, we have our organization, Hindus for Human Rights, has four panels that will be taking place. They are challenging Christian and Hindu nationalism, shared struggles and opportunities, confronting caste, a multi-faith struggle for human rights, advancing human rights for South Asia's religious minorities. And then this one has Audrey and me, the importance of freedom of speech to defend human rights. Please come to those panels if you're in Chicago or if you can come and be part of the movement and travel to Chicago. Please join us in Hindus for Human Rights, Sadhana, or any number of our Muslim, Dalit, Christian, Sikh, secular organizations that are of inseparable coalition fighting hate. The best way, perhaps the only way to fight fascism is to refuse to let them divide us. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita, for your powerful words. Um, the parliament is a place where we all, each one of us, needs to stand up for the other. It's a place of solidarity. And I remember the Toronto parliament, there were death threats against the Swami. I was by his side through the entire plenary at which he was threatened. And so I think we, in solidarity, we may disagree with one another, but threatening someone's life uh, and because of the views that they hold uh, is not acceptable, at least in the society that we are here in the West. And I should neither be, and I think it's not acceptable in South Asia either. Uh, I had prepared a list of questions, but I think we've had even better questions from our attendees. And uh, we have about seven more minutes. I'm going to request that we do want to get to as many questions as we can that are in the QA box. I see about 10 of them already. I would like to go through as many of them. We can go maybe 10 minutes, maximum 15 over time, no more. What this means, sisters, is that I would request that your responses be brief and each question be taken by one panelist, and then I will try to balance. This particular question has come twice. And either any one of you can speak, we would like to do so. You all have worked with each other also. Can any of this, any one of you discuss the influence of Hindu nationalism in the Silicon Valley? What organization and companies may be involved and how does that influence impact people in the US and India? Who would like to go? I'm sorry, I, for some reason the audio cut out. Uh, do you, would you be kind enough just to repeat the last part of the question, the last two lines, thank you. The last lines are that what organization and companies in Silicon Valley may be involved in promoting uh, Hindu nationalism and how has that impacted people in the US and in India? Um, I think following the comments that uh, Audrey and Sunita made so well, I wanted to add that nationalism in the United States, what is nationalism in the diaspora, who are and what identifies one as nationalism? These are important questions. I saw some of this on the chat. These are very important. I think alignment with extremism, alignment with the uh, discourses and practices of the Hindu nationalist government and India. I want to also point out that this is the first time in India the BJP has been in power, the parliamentary wing of the Sangh Parivar or Hindu. They've been in power before, but this is that openly their identification with the RSS and Hindu nationalism has not been disavowed. Uh, those that seek to have or be those that be world, those that seek to live in a world, the actions and practices of this long, turbulent and problematic history of Hindu nationalism would club nationalists. And in the United States, I think the 
with respect to funds, with respect to people's participation and in Silicon Valley, I want to make a small comment. I received my bill, my phone bill from a company, the phone company, and instead, and just before that, some hate mail that talked about how I was uh, uh, against Hindus. I'm of Hindu descent myself against Hindus and against and did not wish to talk about the genocide of Hindus at a certain point in Kashmir, which had not occurred. So as a scholar, I can't really talk about something that has not occurred. So I received a spate of hate mail. And then the next month, when I open my phone bill, just before I open it, something strikes me. And in place of my name, it said Hindu genocide. So you have to think about this because it's not easy for a phone company in the United States to take out your name and to put Hindu genocide on it and to mail it to you. So sort of levitation and access and a certain kind of sort of business. And I'm talking about 13 years ago. This is not even now when they are much more emboldened, but levels of access, levels of emboldenment, levels of both sort of... Uh, I understand that there's a lot of, uh, this is the question I've been asked, is there Hindu phobia? Is there racism against people of Hindu descent? Absolutely. There's racism against people of most communities of color and people who are of Hindu descent experience that racism. Does that connote to Hindu phobia? No, because Islamophobia has a certain apparatus that endows it in the United States. Hindus do not have that apparatus that target them in ver variety of professional, institutional, uh, uh, state and non-state ways. So no, the question of Hinduphobia, this is an adjacent point I wish to make. But in Silicon Valley, there's been a lot of support that has been ratcheted up. And this has started way before in 2002. This happened in 2005. This happened when Mr. Modi was here the last time. And this time, of course, he was only in DC, so that we did not see that. But, but forms of support through those who inhabit these companies, lead these companies, that have led to the consolidation, I believe, of this movement and supported it with funds and supported its ideology or the prominence of its ideology or the vera or uh, how shall I say, the, the endorsement of its ideology by aligning people who work in these companies, by aligning themselves with its practice. Thank you, Angana. Uh, there's a question here for Audrey. It's, I think it's right along your alley, Audrey, because you are a historian that sees how it connects with modern times. Do you see the trajectory of Hindu nationalism in the US and in India going the way of anti-Semitism in France during the 19th century and anti-Semitism in Germany in the 20th century? Audrey? It's a, it's a good question. The historians don't usually predict the future. Right, we leave poor predictions about the future for political scientists. That, that's their job. Right. Um, that said, so I, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I have no idea where this goes. I sure hope it doesn't go the way anti-Semitism went in Germany. Right, like w regardless of what I think in my heart of hearts might happen, I sure hope we don't we don't end up at that point. Um, I certainly do expect escalating violence. Right. And I have for years and I've been borne out on that. That is by no means an, you know, an innovative insight on on my part. Um, I will note that we're starting to see more violence associated with Hindu nationalists in the United States. Right. There, there were some cases, especially last summer, one of sort of threatened violence um, and then one of actual violence and an encounter in California. So I, th I think we're we're headed nowhere good. If you want a note of hope. All right, I don't I don't do hope all the time, but let me let me give you a note of hope now. The fascist fever always breaks. It never lasts forever. And so Hindu nationalism will fall apart someday, right? I certainly hope that I live to see that day. The question is how much damage it will do on the way out. That's the question. Thank you. My, the next question, Sunita, is for you. I think I know the answer, but I'd like to verbalize it. Very interesting question, the way it is put. What Hindu religious convictions contribute to such extreme nationalism? In my view, 
the Hindu faith is very diverse, very tolerant, very loving. But the question is asked is what is it that contributes to this extreme nationalism in a religious tradition that is so peace loving and so diverse? I don't think it's the uh, religious traditions that are contributing to it. I think it's a voracious um, political ideology that wants to you know, eat itself in a way to, to, to have the power. It's fueled by a victim mentality, which is and a minority mentality. It's like you're a victimized minority in your own land, even though you're the majority and you have all the power, but somehow this ideology, it, you know, and the other thing is that a um, hundred years ago, the blueprint was set. So the, the Hindutva book that Sabarkar wrote and other texts like that laid out this, you know, this, uh, this roadmap to having a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu nation. And that is what now they have the power to, you know, implement that blueprint. So there's a, there's a hundred years of grassroots work while we were not paying attention, we were not um, fighting hate at the grassroots. This was happening, you know, while on our watch, but we were asleep at the wheel, all of us. And now um, this is their moment of power and the, the thinking has been done. They just need to follow Savarkar and other such thinkers um, playbook. It is not religious teachings. It is political ideology. It is a fascist political ideology. Thank May you. I add something to this, please? Sure. I think uh, very well said, Sunita, thank you for that. And I think as an anthropologist, you know, one sort of, and having worked in India since 1984, the program against the Sikh community, I worked in the camps. That was my first sort of, uh, you know, professional encounter. I grew up in Kolkata, so one had already seen what violence looks like in my, anyway, sort of family was targeted. But um, I think as an anthropologist, sort of the, the, the intersection of religion and culture, and I mm. think the ways in which Hindu cultural dominance has been sort of carefully architectured since 1947. And I think that architecturing allows for also reinterpretations. We have, I have seen, for example, uh, Hindus uh, in small villages in, in Eastern India who would have certain forms of worship. And they now have had in the past couple of decades, uh, people come in from the Bajrang Dal or the VHP or the RSS and bring in sometimes towering statues, which are very light colored in color. And they are of gods and goddesses that are largely gods that are not familiar to them. And they're often larger than the homes that uh, surround them. So they'll be placed in the middle of the village and people will be asked now to worship the right gods and to leave behind those that actually don't matter or are inferior. So they in which sort of the hyper-masculinization of the nation, feminization of the nation, sacralization, uh, sacralization of the nation takes place through a certain Brahminical agency. And I think the Brahminical agency determines what is the right way to be a Hindu, what are sort of the right modalities of worship, and draws on some of uh, some some of really some really problematic legacies, like for example, example the Manushwiti, from which uh, the tonsuring of uh, Christians, we have seen this repeatedly, of Dalits who've converted due to caste oppression to Christianity, the forcible tonsuring of them as sort of, you know, uh, gesturing to uh, forms of evisceration and rape, symbolic rape, have taken place, drawing from and scripting uh, its logic from uh, texts like Manushmiti. So I think there's a complicated process through which religion rooted through culture becomes something that is violent. Yeah. Or, or can be weaponized, rather. Yes. Karen, if I could just agree with... with sure. um, a brief with comment, yes. Yes, agree with you completely, and you're absolutely right. And just in February and March of this year, um, a few of us from Hindus for Human Rights were in India on what we call Prema Yatra, Pilgrimage of Love, because we were horrified by the gathering of Hindu religious leaders in Haridwar in December 2021. Hundreds of them gathered to literally call for a genocide against Muslims, and they asked for all Hindus to take up swords, and do to Muslims what was happening to the Rohingya. It was explicit and, you know, very, very ugly. 
And ever since then, we were missing Swami Avnivesh and wondering where are any Hindu religious leaders that might um, say anything. And so we went on this journey and we went, we visited perhaps around 30 ashrams, um, a short list of ashrams where we, through our own work and our, what people told us, um, that we, we thought the leaders there, the religious leaders would be um, aligned with us and not for the hatred of Hindutva and Hindu nationalism. And about half of the ashrams that we went to, we did indeed find religious leaders who were isolated, um, lonely, not scared to speak as such, but if they do speak, the consequences, the risks are not just to them, but all the people that follow their, that follow their ashram and you know that are um, associated with them. So a real sense of if they speak, many people will be hurt and they didn't necessarily know each other. These swamis and sadhavis who um, who are just completely aghast at what's happening and, and horrified and wondering where is the Hindu, where is the loving Hindu tradition? They don't necessarily have a community of each other. So we, from far away, are, are building that group, connecting them to each other. And one other thing to affirm what you were saying is when we, some of the ashrams we visited, we we met people and we were told of people who were, who, have, who were brought to those ashrams from the RSS. So RSS is planting their own hateful, in, in Islamophobic um, swamis in ashrams around the country so that they have the loud voice and they call the shots on what that ashram represents. That is happening and we saw it with our own eyes. Thank you, Sunita. One of the things I would like our viewers to know that uh, at Roots for Peace USA, we received several requests that on today's webinar, we should have somebody who can come and defend Hindu nationalism. Let me be very clear. We've had several programs last year on the rise of white nationalism in the United States. We dare not and would never invite a white Christian nationalist to come and defend it. We would not either do it even for Hindu nationalists. Let me be very clear, this is not a forum to come and defend religious nationalism, okay, which promotes exclusion and hate under the cover of it being a balanced program. Okay? And so I do want to apologize to my uh, Hindu brother and sister somehow want this to happen, but I'm saying thanks, but no thanks. We would never give a platform to religious nationalists to promote their exclusive theology. It doesn't matter what religious tradition that they might be from. Here is a specific question, and that is, and I think anyone, if you can take that, who's aware, what is the impact of the United States appointing Chandra Arya to the Department of Homeland Security's faith-based Security Advisory Council. Are any of you aware of this and what impact it might have? Well, I can just say that um, he's uh, known, you know, explicitly known to be a um, supporter of Hindu nationalism, as it is our country's border policies and actions have been brutal, Islamophobic, and so if you have a Hindu nationalist on a body like that with the power that that presumably brings, it doesn't seem like a, a very, um, it doesn't seem like it bodes well for already uh, marginalized people in the world. May I add just a comment on it? I think uh, you're absolutely right, Sunita. And I think Audrey, in your talk, you pointed to how dangerous it becomes because you then have, someone in a position of power who, regardless of what the information is that is presented before such a commission or a committee, has the ability to convince from the inside. And that becomes really problematic. And uh, Dr. Butalia, to your, Taranjit, to your point earlier, it's sort of like asking on a panel with uh, feminists who are talking about sexualized violence, could we invite someone who could actually be a proponent of rape? So why would we invite people and, and, and to also say that there are enormous spaces that the Hindu right has in which to speak 
They do not invite us. We do not necessarily, I, for example, do not wish to be invited there. So then also to want to take over these spaces that that logic of dominance to me is astounding. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. So the next question. Sorry, sorry can, I make, uh, can I make a very ahead, please? Yes. comment on that? Um, I also, I mean, I think we all get this a lot, right? The Hindu nationalists, you know, why, why don't we have a voice? Why can't you debate me? Folks, the door is open and the invitation is open. But for me, I have one playing field. It's peer-reviewed scholarship. You get something to that and we'll talk, all right? But there's a reason why your views aren't there because they are groundless and they are based on ideology and you can't back them up, right? So try, try, try to do what I do. Try to get stuff past peer review and then we'll talk. Thank you, sisters. And like I said, we will never give oxygen to people who want to defend religious nationalism that creates walls and exclusion and hate. So, okay, here's a question, Sunita, for you, which I think is important. It says Hindutva elements are encroaching into Hindu temples in the US, and in some places they have more influence than others. What would be a plan of action or what needs to be done to take back these places of worship? into the mainstream Hindu community? It's such an important question. And Sadhana, which is at this point 12 years old, has been trying without resources. We're all volunteer and we don't have staff and we don't have funding. But we have the, that question that was just asked is the primary you know, motivator for just about everything that we do. The temple spaces, barring some Indo-Caribbean temples, the te Indian temple spaces really are choking with Hindu nationalism. There, I don't know of one where I can go and my feelings, my views, my questions would be welcome. I don't know one. If there is one, I'm happy to hear about it. And I'll only, I would be so, so happy to go to a temple which is inclusive of the kinds of things that I'm concerned about. Um, and so we need religious spaces, temples or not temples. They don't have to be temples. They can be um, spiritual spaces. They, it can be outside. It doesn't have to be inside. Spaces where we can pray and live and gather as radically inclusive, earth honoring, honoring of each other, LB, LGBTQ inclusive, gender equal um, religious spaces. And all of that, you know, all of those values and more that I just laid out, they are affirmed by Hindu religious traditions. It, 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 there's nothing contradictory between having a radically inclusive worship space and being Hindu. And if we had money, we would build a temple. We would build temples all across the land. What we do have is a progressive priest network. We have um, a growing number of priests and priestesses who are Hindu. Um, some are queer identified, not all. And we regularly match families with these progressive priests for all the occasions in life where a family will desire a religious ceremony, birth, marriage, death, other rites of passage. And this is something that we do day in, day out. And, it's, and speaking of hope, Audrey, that gives me hope that this many families are searching for progressive priests and priestesses to come and marry their children. We do so many same-sex marriages, for instance. So we're, if, if there's anyone out there who really cares about, um, about this question that we just discussed, I would say support Savana. We are the organization that, is, that has a 10-year track record and has our spiritual advisory council, our theo theologians and priests and priestesses who can do the religious theological work to undergird an endeavor like this. So please support us in that. Thank you. And a follow-up question quickly is, uh, Sunita, is what is the role of Hindu chaplains at universities? What role can Hindu chaplains play at various universities? Well, ch Hindu chaplains sh should be able to play a huge role in this because they are, you know, they are, um, they are charged with taking care of the hearts and souls of our young. And the young show up with questions and the young show up on campuses with insecurities, vulnerabilities, ideas that need shaping. And so chaplains can play, can really do a lot to affirm 
um, affirm the questions of young Hindu Americans or anybody as they're dealing with the pressure that must come from being in a South Asian community where Hindu nationalism is so strong. So if we have Hindu chaplains on campuses that are able to be open-minded and make room for young people who are very uncomfortable with the, um, with the hate that is, I can tell you, explicitly spoken in family spaces, temple spaces, every community space. It, I, in my experience, it doesn't happen. I've been to conferences of Hindu chaplains and the, the small question that one of us who might be present, if we are welcome, often we are not invited, about caste and Hindu nationalism feels like a violence to that space. We, those questions and those concerns are not welcome in the existing space for Hindu chaplains. I was a Hindu religious life advisor for one year at Columbia University. There was, a, there was an entire petition that was put together, hundreds of people signed it to prevent me from being that religious life advisor, which is like a chaplain. And I found out from Columbia that most of the sign, almost all of the signers were not even from Columbia. Columbia stood by me and I played that role for a year. And in that year, it was the only year that the Columbia Hindu students um, engaged in, it was during COVID, they engaged in deep interfaith seva service during COVID. They, that had not, I was told by the students and the dean that had not happened before. I, I, I think every student group out there, Hindu South Asian student group, look for progressive inclusive Hindu chaplains. It will change the, the climate on your campus. One last thing, sorry. We, I'm so proud that Hindus for Human Rights, along with Indian American Muslim Council, is about to conduct a Hindu Muslim bridge building project on five university campuses across the United States to build love wow. and break down walls of hate. That's lovely. If you can send me a link to that, I would be glad to share it with our attendees who would get an email tomorrow. One last question. And that deals with what is the role of other religious minorities in India, particularly the Jain, Sikh, Muslim, uh, and Christian community. It's my understanding, and correct me, Audrey and Angana, that uh, some Jains from Gujarat do support Modi's tactics financially and otherwise. But I have seen increasing reports of individual Sikh leaders as well as some Muslim leaders. Who, I mean, if you saw by the picture when Modi came down from the aircraft, it was very clearly positioned. There was a Muslim looking man that was greeting or trying to greet Modi very, very warmly. So there has been those cases. Could you just talk about that dynamics of what is going on with some of the religious minorities and how some of them feel they have to support Modi? Um. Just very briefly, from my research in Indian administered Kashmir and in India, when someone of a minority community or in Kashmir, the Muslim community was in majority there, but targeted, uh, or Sikhs, and I've done work in Punjab uh, on the decade of disappearances, so for example, Sikhs from Punjab, or other communities, when they, uh, you know, uh, participate in nationalist, Hindu nationalist agendas or policies or politic, um, I think there needs to be some discernment on our part on how to interpret that process. Because there's mm -hmm. incredible amounts of fear of being targeted, there's vulnerabilities, there's isolation, that, that coerces participation when it does, and it is not prevalent, I wish to underscore, A, B, that there are various forces that coerce such participation, and that it is also, let us not forget, in the deep interest of both the Hindu nationalist state as well as its cadres to constitute what they would understand to be a collaborator class. But at the same time, people participating know from these communities that they are always under suspicion, as do sort of an ordinary Muslim individual living their life in India today. If they so go from 
work to home, keeping quiet about things they ordinarily would not have kept quiet about, I think it behooves certainly uh, as scholars, as for myself, as someone of Hindu descent, to ask the question, why? Because if we were standing up, if the dominant community were taking the lead in standing up, then yes, of course, one can expect others to join. But if they are not, and as I echo Sunita here and underscoring that they are not, and if we did, of course, the power of authoritarianism unravels very quickly, right? His power is from thus far elected, uh, 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 you know, the electorate, it can crumble. So just that. And I think, um, yes, I agree with our panel that authoritarian regimes do not last, simply that. Thank you. I began with sharing with all of you that we have three fearless women. And now you can see they have dedicated their lives to this. They get threats every day. They get hate mail every day, as Angana talked about how in her phone bill, you know, these come through, but they still go on. My last question, each one of you, before we close, is what gives you hope? I'll first go to Audrey, then to Angana, and then Sunita. What gives you hope every day? Audrey, you go first. So I suppose I'll say two things, one more hopeful than the other. Um, I think what gives me the, the sort of the internal strength to continue doing this in the face of considerable negative consequences for my life um, is, is that I know I'm on the side of righteousness, right? I, I know I'm on the right side. Um, and, and so what else are you supposed to do, right? When you have that, that sort of clarity of ethics, you know, my choices to be unethical or, or to continue as I'm doing. Um, so that gives me comfort. That said, I mean, I also, and this is the second thing, which is not quite as hopeful, um, is we may well lose still, right? Just because Hindu nationalism will fall someday doesn't mean that we don't lose in the process, right? Um, some battles are worth fighting, regardless of whether you're on the winning side or not. And this is one for me. Thank you. Angana? Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, I ask myself often, as I see colleagues be incarcerated, as I see communities that I'm speaking with, I spoke with, uh, uh, you know, people close to people who had committed suicide in Assam uh, when their citizenship had been, uh, you know, threatened. Um, as I see family, friends in India, as I live in what is veritably become an exile, as I remember the violence, as I see the violence, I also remember physically being targeted, but I know that that targeting is so much more vociferous and violent today in, for people who live there. And then I think of people for whom social media platforms, all of this is, it's not, it's not there for them. They are alone. They are not being targeted simply. Uh, they are not being targeted in a context where simply they are able to turn to someone. They're not able to turn to someone. And all of the violence, uh, that which is verbal, that which is physical, is right outside their homes every day. So when I look at all that, I think one asks oneself, what is hope? Is it persistence? Is it a life lived with purpose? Is it something you draw from legacy and history and community, the memory of my father, all the people that one sees and knows? Uh, I think somewhere hope is not giving up. And this is a moment in time, as all those accounts we have read of other moments in time that strangely inspire us, you know, of those people who stood their ground. This is a moment in time. It's also our moment to keep doing what we do. So in that is hope. In this is hope. Just that. Thank you, sister, for sharing your tears and your words. Sunita? I don't, know how, I don't really know how to answer that question when I'm the most optimistic person I know and I often wake up feeling 
very, very demoralized about the state of affairs in my beloved India. You know, 20 something years ago when I started work on women's rights in Afghanistan, somebody said, go work on India, go work on women's rights in India. You're not Afghan, you're not Muslim, leave us alone. And I just remember thinking, things are okay in India, thank you very much. Oh my gosh, if I had, I had no idea where, where we were headed in India. So I think my answer is a sort of a combination of Angana and Audrey's answers. Um, Audrey, you spoke like a true Hindu because there's that's the one of the core, you know, de definitions of being a Hindu is that you do your dharma, you figure out what you're supposed to do, and you just do it. You, there's you there's no expectation of win or success. You do it because it's what you've got to do. And I think that's what we're all doing for sure. And there's no turning back because as Audrey said, that is absolutely, we are on, there was the moment in Howdy Modi where I saw everybody going into the stadium. And I just felt so fortunate that I, I, I could have been those people, but I'm awake and I'm so lucky that I'm here and not there. And finally, hope, what Angana was saying, the people, Afrin Fatima, in her house, which is about to be bulldozed and refusing to leave. The people who are in the front line of this hatred, standing up day after day, never mind the consequences, never mind risk of life, arrest, standing up for what is right, that gives me hope. Thank you to all three of you. Uh, normally, I would say a few things saying you give great remarks, but today I'm going to digress from that. We will take a moment of silence in which all of us are welcome to say a prayer or whatever you'd like to lift up. Blessing my three courageous and fearless sisters who have not only shared their scholarship with us today, they have shared their hearts and their tears. So let's take a moment of silence. Thank you, friends. I know this has taken longer than we had anticipated, but uh, a very important conversation, which yet I believe is only the tip of the iceberg. There is much for all of us to learn about this and then work towards building and supporting coalitions that can work to reduce the influence of such faith-based nationalism of hate and exclusion in our own country and across the world. We are very appreciative also of Vasu Bhandu of Arizona Faith Network, who quietly has been providing the live Spanish translation for today's webinar. And we thank each of you who attended today through Zoom and Facebook Live. Tomorrow, all our Zoom registrants will receive an email with a link to today's program, as well as relevant resources that will be shared by all our panelists, including books, websites, fact sheets, and what you can do and what you can support and other relevant online sources. Dear friends in faith and conscience, at this time, I it's time, it looks like there's a lot more to talk about, right? But I think there are times to say goodbye. And so this is the place to do so. Please go in peace as all of us as people of faith and people of no faith, people of conscience, work together to create pathways to peace and justice.